So why collaborate? Okay, it started out because I couldn't spell, and I thought that's pretty cool. There's this uh, ER in collaborate, and if I turn that around, that's RE, and RE's fun. And then Tim reminded me that it's collab orate, OR, and so we're, now we're stuck with it. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the historical reasons for the bad name. Uh, but the goal is, uh, it's, it's basically a, a very much inspired by Pedro Mamini's Ida Sync tool. If anybody's uh, ever heard of it and or tried to use it. Uh, and uh, founded on the fact that uh, reverse engineering binaries can be a very complex, time-consuming task. And working in large groups, uh, it, it's nice to get a lot of eyes on the same binary and share the information that, that people are deriving as they work their way through the binary. In the past, uh, pr prior to Ida Sync, uh, that was uh, basically you could either share databases in a serial fashion. I do some work, I give it to you, you do some work. Things quickly diverge and uh, we can get together with our laptops next to one another and bring comments over or devise interesting ways to export portions of the database using uh, various scripting techniques. Uh, but uh, Pedram took a great step forward when he, uh, he came up with the notion of, well, let's build a server. Let's see if we can't uh, hack some asynchronous networking code into IDA via its plugin architecture. And let's, uh, let's push some of the commands and the updates that people are making in the database out to that server where they can be cached and shared among uh, several uh, reverse engineers working on the same binary. Um, another problem that uh, we uh, were interested in overcoming was the fact that uh, we uh, deal with people using various uh, different versions of IDA. So it becomes uh, much more difficult to share databases in that case. I uh, have many uh, starving students working for me who are very much tied uh, to and appreciative of the freeware version of IDA. Uh, and that is not always capable of opening all databases. Uh, newer versions of IDA have a database format that's not backwards compatible. Uh, so anything I create, I can't just push out uh, to share with my students. Um, and as we went along the way, we uh, considered ways that we'd like to improve on IdaSync. Uh, and basically, it's, it's a ground up uh, implementation of IdaSync-like ideas that uh, doesn't uh, borrow on IdaSync code uh, too much. Um, so the overall goals of the project are to uh, provide a way to capture uh, state changes that people make to their databases. And uh, it's not to bring everybody onto one machine working on one database. So the state changes are captured uh, in, in one version of our uh, server uh, in a SQL database stored according to project uh, that you happen to be working on, which is very much tied to the input file uh, via MD5 uh, sum matching. And uh, these updates are tagged uh, based on user uh, login credentials so we can track uh, updates to users. And then anybody else who joins the project uh, can automatically receive all the updates that have been made, uh, more or less bringing their database, uh, very much a separate database, uh, into a state that uh, nearly mirrors, hopefully fully mirrors, the state of uh, the original database or all of the databases that are sharing uh, on the project. Uh, we wanted to be able to allow people to uh, you know, migrate in and out of the project at will uh, and not be tied to sort of one mass reversing session. Let's descend on a table, let's all jack in, let's fire up the server, share, 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 uh, ready, ready, break. And then everybody goes and has their databases diverge uh, wildly in format. So uh, again, the idea is you can, you can walk away, come back and get everything you missed. You can, walk, or you can, you can join in 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months later and uh, pick up all the changes that have made uh, since the uh, creation of the initial project. Uh, we also uh, figured uh, there are many times uh, in reversing where you're, you're working your way down a path in a binary. Maybe you need to manipulate the binary in some way, uh, transform it uh, somehow, and you uh, kind of, th that makes you pause and wonder, well, I could really screw this up. So uh, I may like a way to either back out of my changes, have some sort of save point. Uh, and the idea here was that uh, we wanted to leverage the capabilities of the Collaborate server to uh, take a step towards save pointing, checkpointing uh, uh, projects. 
So the idea with a simple checkpoint is just a bookmark into the, the current database uh, that we're maintaining of changes, and you can come back, uh, discard uh, all your previous changes, connect to a project, and accept databases up to your last save point. So it, it's, it, while it's not a rollback, it's kind of a replay to current state. Right now we don't have a way to capture sufficient amount of information to do true undo capability, uh, but we hope that at some point as the IDA API evolves uh, in the SDK that so we can capture more state information and be able to do uh, kind of incremental undos, uh, leveraging the information that's been stored on the server. Uh, along with the checkpoint uh, notion was, well, uh, how about uh, forking a project? So you decide you'd like to go down two different paths perhaps, and uh, we uh, wanted the capability to just have a group go off on and work on one path, creating an entirely separate project while some, cho some may choose to stay uh, in an original project. So there's a, a forking capability which actually creates an entirely separate project that are parallel to a point but then are allowed to diverge uh, down different paths. So you could come in and rejoin it up to any of the fork points, follow any of the fork points, and so on. So th the basic idea to get this implemented, uh, it, first of all, if you're not familiar with uh, Ida Sync, the way they uh, chose to implement that was to add a variety of hotkeys uh, via Ida's plugin architecture, and the hotkeys would be additional ways to uh, perform some Ida actions. For example, uh, a new hotkey sequence was added to add a Ida Sync specific style of comment. And if you chose to insert an Ida Sync style comment, then the plugin would push that comment out to the server. But it was very much a notion of I, I have extra hotkeys to learn now, and I have to remember to use those hotkeys in order to share my changes. So if I insert a normal comment, then everybody doesn't see it. I have to remember, oh, people are complaining, I don't see it. So, oh yeah, okay, Ida Sync comment, alternate hotkey sequence, and away it goes. So you're limited in the number of actions that you could share based on the number of implemented uh, hotkey sequences and associated actions. Um, and uh, you were, it, the, the installation was somewhat more complex because it required you to come in and tailor your IDA plugins configuration file to actually map all the new hotkey sequences into the IDA sync plugin. Um, there are some other, we actually looked uh, uh, on with, uh, you know, a great desire of using their networking code. And as we started uh, using some of their networking code, we realized that the, the number of changes that we were pushing uh, uh, far outstripped uh, the, the capability of that bit of networking code. So we basically rewrote uh, the networking, the asynchronous networking piece from scratch. And I uh, think we've come up with a pretty uh, robust solution uh, that is easily stripped out of IdaSync, or IdaSync, Collaborate. <laughs> I did not rip it out of IdaSync entirely. Uh, easily stripped out of Collaborate and uh, taken into any other project that you may wish to do asynchronous communications with. The users unfamiliar with Ida may know that, may not know that Ida is pretty much single threaded. Uh, you don't start uh, separate threads of execution in Ida because uh, Ida performs no uh, locking mechanisms around its internal database accesses. Uh, and uh, because it's single threaded in addition to a locking problem, you don't want to perform any blocking operations uh, in your plugins, otherwise Ida just kind of sits and waits for stuff to happen until your plugin is completed and returned uh, control back to Ida. So the asynchronous communications are pretty much essential uh, if you just don't want to stare at a frozen screen. So our implementation instead leverages the capabilities of Ida's uh, uh, software development kit and the API architecture, which allows you to register your interest in various Ida events that are generated or fired off in response to uh, user actions. So these events are, are triggered automatically in uh, association with user actions such as adding comments or renaming functions or undefining bytes or reformatting portions of the database. And this was seemed like a much more natural way to capture what was going on as the database was manipulated by the user. So we decided we would register for virtually everything uh, take the information that was forwarded to us with each notification and push a uh, sufficient amount of that information over to a server where users uh, tied to the same project uh, could receive them via the server's kind of mirroring publishing uh, architecture. 
uh, which so that's how the server behaves. In fact, it just mirrors all received packets out to any connected users while caching packets uh, or datagrams, as we call them, for uh, anybody who may connect to the project in the future. Uh, Asynchronous comms, I guess I kind of get out of order, and that's uh, the nature of my talk, so I apologize. Uh, and so this pretty much summarizes stuff that uh, I've already said. Uh, the, the limitations that we're dealing with are primarily forced on us by uh, the manner in which IDA, being a primarily GUI application on the Windows architecture, uh, uh, runs its Windows uh, pro message processing loop. So we've basically got to get tied into that loop, and the way to do that uh, in this case is through the use of Windows asynchronous sockets, which uh, advertise uh, various network events in the form of uh, Windows messages received through the message queue. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the things that we dealt with as we developed this uh, and, and worked our way through the IDA API um, were, and especially as we thought about uh, the undo capability, are there, there are no pre-notifications. Uh, IDA certainly knows it's about to rename an address, but it doesn't tell you that it's about to rename an address. You are notified only that the address has been renamed. So, if we had uh, pre-notification events, we could capture the, the current name of an address and capture the new name of an address, and then we would actually be capturing sufficient information to start uh, providing a rollback capability. Uh, since we're, we're notified after the fact of all changes, it's very difficult to uh, know exactly what we would roll back to. We thought about some techniques for leveraging uh, a second kind of dummy uh, copy of IDA on, the, uh, on a, a given project. And that copy of IDA would generate no updates because there's no user associated with it. But receiving all updates would choose to capture its current state prior to applying an update. And we could use that copy of IDA to uh, generate a sufficient amount of information to provide for some sort of rollback capability. Uh, so uh, again, uh, in addition to that limitation, we, we ran across the occasional bug here and there and the occasional mission feature here and there and uh, received, I, I can't thank him enough, uh, tremendous support from ILFAC. Uh, for those who've ever dealt with uh, IDA support, uh, it's pretty instantaneous uh, turnaround uh, on uh, most reasonable requests. So he actually made changes to the API and fixed some bugs in uh, inf near instantaneous time which allowed us to make uh, you know, continued forward progress on, the pro progress on the project. So the user interface to this thing is uh, we tried to keep it pretty slim. We didn't want to keep popping dialog boxes all the time because that's clearly pretty annoying. Um, so we created, uh, we just went ahead and built our own dialog boxes outside of IDA, even though IDA provides some limited capability of, of building basically format string based uh, GUI components. Uh, we didn't have the, quite the flexibility we wanted, so we used custom Windows dialog boxes. Uh, if you've ever considered doing that in IDA plugins or never, and, and not done it, then um, perhaps this code will serve as an example to help you customize your plugins in that uh, direction. Um, the, the, the biggest reason that drove us to that was uh, IDA's uh, text fields uh, don't offer password hiding. So for that reason alone, we wanted to use native Windows controls and be able to uh, obscure passwords as they were being entered. Um. Okay. Uh, this this kind of sums up a lot of the stuff that uh, we just came to our minds as we were developing the plugin. Um, as we started caching these things on a, on a database, uh, every update's tied to both a project and a user, and then it occurred to us that uh, maybe we want to be able to manage these databases somehow, um, which is uh, in interesting ways since we can now turn this into a, a SQL kind of manipulation problem with all the, the changes that are sitting there stored on the server. Uh, project forking was one of the early things that came up. Checkpoint said, hey, that's pretty cool. We can just add a table and, and, and point at the last update uh, give it a uh, pseudo name and, and have a very lightweight project, if you will. Um, we uh, are very interested in, in fact, uh, it's, it's just about off the, off the table, um, looking at migrating projects from one server to another so as a quick SQL dump, export from one uh, server, import to another server. And so we've tried to build in the mechanisms to allow you to do that and deconflict your projects uh, from one server to another and leave them with some sort of global identification capability across various servers. Uh, and that way, uh, again, instead of shipping your databases and worrying about what versions of IDA folks 
may have or may not have, uh, you can say, well, fire up Collaborate, do a project dump, capture all the changes that you've already done, and just join the project. Okay, bring your version of 5.0 up to date with the stuff that we generated on 5.3 uh, or what have you. Um, uh, one we keep uh, kicking back and forth and we're just not sure where to go with this is uh, the ability to work offline. Sort of, okay, I'm tied to a project and I'm going to be traveling and whatnot and away from the uh, network connection for a while. Am I limited? Can I make any changes? Or do I really need to wait till I'm tied back to that server? So this was a tough one um, because uh, we're not trying to be CVS. Okay, we're, we're not trying to, to generate all kind of, uh, you know, conflict resolutions on merges and things like that. It's very much of a, a last update wins kind of thing. Uh, so if we're patching bytes on top of one another, whoever makes the last update kind of wins. Um, and for the time being, we're of the mind that uh, if you're away from the project and not seeing updates that, that some folks are making, uh, then you may not be influenced by their changes, they may not be influenced by your changes, so you, you don't get to make changes. Actually, you can make changes. It, it, being joined to a project doesn't prevent you from just disconnecting from the project and just going down your own path. Um, you just probably don't want to rejoin the project because you've, you've made a lot of changes that won't be shared. Um, if you think you, you want to rejoin at some point, uh, you can always set a save point before you walk away and then you'll be able to roll right back up to where everybody happens to be. But they won't get your changes at, at the present time. Uh, and then we thought about, well, hey, I, I'm a teacher. I work with lots of students, and I'd love to do this so I can kind of drive their IDA displays um, as I'm working my way through a database and say, we go down here and reformat code here. We'll throw in some comments here. And while I'm doing all this, please don't bork my database. Okay, so I really don't necessarily want them publishing changes out to me. So I want to make them perhaps read-only subscribers in this environment or prohibit them from making some of the more dangerous types of updates. Um, so we started looking at, well, can we categorize the types of permissions, uh, types of updates that are being made, and uh, split them out into various publish and subscribe permissions. So we tried to uh, offer a granular uh, sort of uh, subscription capability. You can subscribe to comments only, or you can subscribe and publish comments and name changes. There's a variety of categories. Um, that's, uh, we we're not going to run down through them, but you'll see various slides that uh, point to that. Um, talked a bit, little bit about why undo is difficult, so I'm going to kind of blow through this slide. Basically, we're just not getting enough information uh, pushed out of the database that's generating the, the change event to be ordered in order to be able to roll back to its previous state. And uh, more on why working offline is difficult. Again, uh, what we don't want to be doing is pop in uh, conflict uh, resolution dialog boxes all over the place uh, and, and making you work it out because it just it, it hinders your progress through the database uh, to be dealing with uh, pop-up dialogs all the time. Okay, how are we doing? So uh, basically the plugin again, uh, lots of uh, uh, repeat here, but the plugin just registers itself for uh, all uh, interesting notifications. Um, we prefer to trigger the plugin after IDA's initial auto analysis phase because IDA is making massive changes to its database, generating a massive number of updates during that auto analysis phase. Uh, we had played around with disabling auto analysis, having everybody fire up with nothing analyzed, and then having a master database, perhaps the latest and greatest version of IDA with super plugins for analysis, do all of the analysis, and that got kind of hairy. Um, so we just decided that, well, whatever version of IDA you're in, the initial auto analysis that you get from that version of IDA is kind of close enough. So we, we highly recommend you join after that's done. Um, we tried to minimize the amount of state being saved in the plugin. Uh, the things we do save are kind of your, just your last server that you might have been connected to. Uh, we save a global project ID so that we can streamline reconnection once you've uh, joined a project uh, and so on. And then the plugin's job, only job, is to capture your events and package them up and ship them off to a server and then process incoming events that it may receive uh, from other users. So the operation, uh, we do introduce one new hotkey that triggers the plugin, and that's pretty much the extent of our uh, intrusion into your IDA experience. 
Um, so you can take the, the, the binary plugin, drop it into uh, your IDA plugins directory. Uh, at, at the current time, I recommend not renaming it from what it names, it's named by default. That actually breaks the plugin for reasons that we could probably fix but haven't. Um, and then it's just capturing all actions. You, 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 you trigger the plugin, it asks you to join a project, and then it's kind of hands off. So there's no, oops, I forgot to push an update. It's just done for you. Uh, you get various notifications. If you drop your network connection, you drop your connection to the server, you do get a pop-up that warns you, hey, we've, you've lost your connection to the server. Consider reconnecting before you generate any more changes. Um, otherwise, uh, beware that you're diverging from the rest of the project. Uh, so uh, we try to be uh, useful to all users of IDA. Uh, versions are available and the plugin compiles easily for versions of IDA from 4.9 up through 5.3. Uh, the slides came out before 5.3 did. Uh, and it also compiles or if you have an SDK for the freeware, uh, but we provide a, a binary for the freeware version as well. Um, build scripts are made available for G++ and uh, Visual Studio. Um, you have to build a plugin for your specific version of IDA. We do some uh, very version specific things as the versions become more capable. So there are some header files in there that have actually check through and determine exactly which version of IDA you happen to be using and we, we try to use the right uh, features for your particular version. Um, again, as the SDKs evolved, uh, more notification messages are being generated by IDA. So newer versions of IDA and their corresponding versions of the plugin are capable of generating more types of events, capturing more of the changes that you make to the database. Uh, older versions of IDA, like 4.9.5.0, uh, actually are, are not nearly as capable in regards to publishing, but every version of the plugin can receive and process every type of update. So while as a 4.9 user, your changes may not be pushed uh, to everybody, as often as you like, but you will receive every type of update that, say, a 5.3 user makes, even though you cannot make those same updates yourself. This is a breakdown. It probably looks better on the slide deck uh, of the capabilities uh, by version. Um, and you can see it's kind of split up into uh, publish and subscribe sides. Um, and uh, the publish uh, capabilities improve as you improve IDA versions, uh, uh, but the subscribe capabilities are consistent across all versions of IDA. Um, and so, I you ready? Yeah. This is Tim's slide. <laughs> uh, just another quick reminder for everybody that came in late or has been moving around. Uh, if you want to participate in the demo, the information's over here on the left-hand screen that's not going uh, at the same time. So there's like a connection information for the local wireless, the uh, auth information and the, the server to connect to. And uh, to be able to see both simultaneously during the demo, you might want to migrate towards the middle, which is why the middle is more dense. So. All right, so this slide talks a little bit about the uh, Collaborate protocol on the network. We chose to do a binary protocol instead of uh, like an ASCII or an XML-based protocol, per se, uh, because a lot of the messages that are generated have binary content. And we didn't want to have to waste a lot of time uh, unpackaging and converting to XML and sending across the network and then repackaging and how you store it and you have to do that for every plugin and the server has to generate. So whatever, we'll just leave it as binary. Um, we just had a, a datagram size that comes ahead, tells you how much more data is coming. And then we have two different types of uh, uh, messages that can go. One is basically destined only for the um, collaborate specific software. So it's how the plugin communicates directly with the server. So we've added those messages uh, unique for the collaborate uh, software. The other ones are due to the updates, the notifications that Chris was talking about that IDA generates. So we'll have different types of notifications that are generated when you uh, rename a function or add a comment or make a structure, update a structure or whatever. All of those things uh, go into the uh, other type of comment and those are um, broadcast from the plugin to the server. The server mirrors them to all currently connected um, clients and then if we're in a database mode for the server, it's also gonna archive it in the uh, SQL database. So the server maintains all the state. Um, a lot of you guys know the advantages of that just by uh, the conference that you're attending. So we wanna leave uh, all of these decisions to be up to the user. So the plugin has uh, the auth components so that you can authenticate to the server and you can connect to the server, but all of the important decisions are made on the server, which uh, potentially you're, you're supposed to trust more. 
Um, so the server can be invoked in two different modes. The database mode, uh, which is the one that we'll demo here today, and it's uh, by far the most feature-rich version. There's also a basic mode if you wanted to collaborate with some people, say in an environment like this, and you didn't bring a SQL database with you and you didn't want to connect out on the internet, you could pull up the server quickly um, using your JVM and you could all connect to the project at the same time and it will do the mirroring but it won't do any of the archiving. Right? Um, so a little bit more on that. Uh, the server requires uh, Java. We tested it on JDK 1.6. Uh, there's the two modes, simple reflector the, for the database mode. We're gonna need the Java connection software so that Java can talk to the database. And uh, that's gonna allow for the persistent storage. Um, it's available in all different kinds of ways. Um, the plugins, of course, are available right now. You can grab them off of the uh, various websites uh, or the, the local uh, website that we have running here. The server will be available starting tomorrow. Uh, we didn't release it for certain reasons until just now. And that'll be available in source. And uh, it'll also be available in a jar if you didn't want to have to deal with the source. And it's also available as a, um, whatever it's called, a, a VMware virtual appliance on uh, the VMware site. So you can literally just start, start it up and connect to it. Right. <coughs> so basic mode requires no database. Um, it still allows multiple projects. So you can have uh, all kinds of different teams working on various uh, RE projects that require more than one set of eyes. And uh, they just won't be stored, right? No persistent storage. Also, kind of as a side effect, that you have no authentication for these kind of things. Where would the auth information come from? Then not storing it in the database. You have to do a flat file. It gets more confusing. You have to diverge. You have to develop a lot more. So really, it's a very simple thing to just quickly throw up and allow you to collaborate uh, for a certain amount of time and then uh, lose your changes. Um, the basic mode doesn't save any information in the IDB. It doesn't have to because it assumes that you're not going to have any persistent storage, so you're not going to be reconnecting to a project later. Um, so all participants have to start at the same time, and as you stop, you're kind of you probably shouldn't come back to the project because your updates will not be in sync with anybody else that's doing it. So the database mode, uh, we had a. Uh, request during development to add MySQL support. So in addition to Postgres, it supports MySQL. Uh, Postgres, it's gonna require 8.2 or higher. It's probably not a big deal, because 8.2 and 8.3 have been out for a little while. Um, that's just due to the nature of some of the, sh the ways that we have formed the SQL statements. So if somebody is more interested in that we are than uh, going and making some more functions, it'll probably work with older versions just fine. Um, so this requires uh, authentication. Basic RFCs for CHAP and MAC, that's good enough. We assume you're probably gonna be running these on some sort of internal, more safe network anyway. Um, so as Chris pointed out, all participants start by running the auto analysis in their plugin, or in their specific version of IDA, and then launching the plugin and connecting. Um, as Chris pointed out again, the auto analysis might be a little different. It might vary based on the particular version of IDA. However, in practice, we've noticed that uh, they get really close and. Uh, uh, just fine for the, the type of stuff that we're doing anyway. So all updates that are posted to the project from any user that's been collaborating in that project are archived in the database. When a new user connects, they get if they join that same project, they get all the updates up to point. So it's really easy to bring somebody else's um, IDB all the way back up to speed with what everybody else has been working on, uh, regardless of their version of IDA. Um, to facilitate kind of joining um, and disjoining or leaving a project. Um, we store a little bit of information in the IDA database. Um, so this is not the SQL database, this is the IDA file, the f uh, database that stores your uh, binary content. Um, that information facilitates quickly uh, reconnecting back to the database, remembering which project you joined to so that you uh, automatically join the same project. If we allowed you to join a different project, it would most definitely be um, out of sync, so to speak, and the uh, updates wouldn't uh, go across correctly. Um, no offline work. Right. All right, the plugin's available now. Server's available tomorrow. I already said that. Okay, so now I'm going to go through a quick overview of uh, some of the, what some of the windows look like if you're on a uh, XP or 2000 kind of a machine, and then we're going to um, get into the demo.
So now you guys need to make sure you have your plugins installed and you can uh, ping the server. And, uh, actually, it doesn't ping, does it? But uh, yeah. you can trigger the plugin. Uh, you can connect to it. Uh, so get that stuff ready. Again, for the latecomers, there's a little bit of incentive for being the first one to make some an edit to the database that's visible on the screen to the rest of the uh, attendees. So after you open the database and the auto analysis finished, you want to activate the plugin with uh, the hotkey Alt F6. You want to enter the uh, connection information for the server, either via host or IP, and then the port, which defaults to uh, 5042. Run it on whatever you want. Then you're going to authenticate the. Uh, IDA creates an MD5 hash of the binary that you've loaded, and that's used as a unique indicator of uh, for the project to make sure that when other people join, they're going to get a list of projects that can only that are only compatible with whatever binary they've loaded in IDA. Right, so that's just kind of the quick safety check that if I've loaded a, a binary and somebody else wants to collaborate with me, if they load a different binary, they're not going to like hammer me with the updates that don't make sense for my database. So then the units are managed by the server. You're going to enter your username, enter your auth information. This is uh, the box that Chris spoke of where we wanted to mask the password. Couldn't do that with uh, the SDK uh, capability for IDA as far as we know. So uh, use uh, regular Windows uh, graphics. So there's two cases when you join. One case is that uh, you were already joined to a project previously and that information was stored in your IDB in which case you're automatically reconnected to the same project and you automatically get any updates that anybody else has made um, to the database while you were offline. If you have never had a project for this particular IDA database, then uh, you can choose to uh, start a new project or you can choose to join other projects if other ones have been made and the MD5 is used as the uniqueness for that. All right, so here's a little uh, example. Uh, so the we have now connected and it shows that there's one project that is somebody else has previously connect, uh, um, created. We know that it's not one that we probably made because if we did, we would have automatically joined to it. Uh, or this could be us using a second instance of IDA to uh, have two computers going for whatever reason. Um, so we can use the options button to look at permissions. These are the granularity the, of permissions that were present um, in what, 5.2, right? The slides are a little bit dated. 5.3 uh, is now out. But you can see that we can choose publish and subscribe permissions um, as we join the project. So another interesting thing we can do, Chris was talking about the scenario where we don't want novice users mucking up a database, but we want to drive it, and we want to drive it in a manner that they can scroll up and down in their own database and look at different areas, and they can even make changes. We just don't want those changes to reflect the things that we're doing up while we're instructing or whatever. Um, so there's actually three sets of permissions. We can set a permission on a particular user account, a novice user, we don't want to let them do anything, so when they log in, they're limited on those permissions. When you connect a plugin and get this type of a graphic, then you can uh, choose what kind of permissions you'd like for that particular session, and then you also set permissions on a per project basis. So all of those things are combined together to figure out whatever your effective permissions are going to be for that particular session. What's that? Okay, go ahead. Well, I'll, add, nope, that's not I'll add one thing that. Uh, the permissions list that you see here is actually driven on the server side. The server publishes this list of permissions and then this dialog box is populated. So if there's stuff you just don't ever want to do, you can trim it at the server without having to have everybody rebuild their plugins. And then you, you just get the tailored list of permissions published by the server. Okay, then in our quest to remove uh, hotkeys, so one of the particularly annoying things about um, the earlier projects that attempt to do this kind of thing, like Ida Sync, are that you have to remember, uh, consciously remember that there's different hotkeys to do different things. So there's a, a thing that looks a lot like an Ida comment, but it's really a, an Ida, Ida Sync comment, and you have to use a different hotkey to get that window, and you have to remember to do that every time you make a comment that you want to share. So if users forget, then they're not sharing things anymore. So all of the commands that we do, uh, just subscribe to the uh, notifications that IDA creates. You basically work as normal and all the updates are sent. So we overload the activation key, so we really only have one hotkey for the whole plugin. So if you hit F6 again once it's loaded, you get um, collaborate specific things. So these are the kind of things where you're generating those messages where the plugin is communicating directly and uh, there's not really an IDA event notification driving those packets going across. So you can see that once you're in there, you can do their various things like fork a project. I'm about to do something crazy. I want to fork, go off my own, and not impose my crazy changes on other people that were working on the project. 
Uh, you can set a checkpoint, which is a, a way to replay up to date. It's kind of like a poor man's undo because we can't do undo yet. Uh, and then you can manage various things and disconnect. Okay. Ready to try the demo out? All right, you know, back to zero. All right, so it, it is demo time, and this is DEF CON. <laughs> so we realize we're taking our presentation into our own hands here and gambling. Um, so uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll fire up uh, and create a project and start making some changes. Uh, Tim will then try to come along and uh, join the project, and, and you can watch his database update over here. Uh, once I've created a project, that project will be visible to anybody who's uh, going to attempt to join the demo uh, on the, the conference wireless. So is, is there anybody who is actually going to attempt to do that? Three. That's great. So the, the, the pool of potential book winners is pretty narrow. <laughs> Odds are good. <laughs> it, 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 if you're already connected, you've got to disconnect and reconnect to our project. And if you're created a project of your own, you're actually slave to that project. So you can't like jump projects. You're going to have to actually shut down your IDA database, create a brand you new have database. To, you have to do run the re uh, open the binary from scratch, right, and have it reanalyze. Yeah. When, once you're tagged as being part of a project, there's no jumping projects unless you choose to fork one. All right, okay. so first things over here on the left side, we uh, have the server menu, and it's just a, a command line little CLI thing. Uh, it was just easy to throw together. There's no reason this couldn't be like a web applet, or uh, it could even have a, a dedicated plugin or something if we wanted to, I suppose. Uh, but the, the actions that are required on the server are very minimal. Uh, another thing that we really wanted to improve upon previous uh, collaboration uh, projects for IDA are that the project creation uh, is all done from the uh, IDA side, from the client side, so to speak. So the only thing that we really have to do over on this side in order to start collaborating from the database is create users so that they can authenticate to the database. So we have an add user, we have list users, we can, we can show you these, they're not very flashy, it's all text-based. Uh, I can scroll up, it doesn't even work very good at this resolution, but you can see we have users where permissions and there's kind of a pseudo-graphical, you can see that for each column, they have publish and subscribe and, and so forth. Um, so we can list projects, we can edit users. The ones with the stars will actually uh, send specific messages out to all connected users so you can get stats on uh, the current status of the projects. Uh, so we can see who's connected from what IPs, ports, and then uh, um, you know how many updates they send of different categories and things like that. So Okay, so I've got Ida up over here. I tried to jack the font up. So it can be seen, but not so much that we see only three lines. Um, basically, the ground rules for trying to get the book are, uh, once I create a project, you'll have the information you need to join. It'll be called something like DEF CON Demo. There we go. Um, DEF CON Demo. <laughs> <laughs> there goes that. Oh, is it already there? My, my IDA crashed. <laughs> Your IDA crashed? IDA, IDA, IDA. Well, <laughs> so I haven't made DEF CON Demo anything? yet, so clearly somebody made a malicious project <laughs> and has uh, owned the software already. I didn't even try and collaborate, it just tanked on its own. Oh, okay, that's an IDA problem, yeah. that's right. <laughs> um, okay, now, to, to obtain the book, you're gonna have to base, so now we have a basic wall of graffiti over here, and as you push your changes, you know, your stuff is gonna show up here, and your goal is to get something that uniquely identifies you, your name will do, uh, up onto the screen. So, you know, I'm not gonna judge that, but I'm gonna look at my screen here, Tim's gonna look at his screen over there, uh, and you're gonna have to get something to appear it, that, that's visible here. So if I'm, if I'm scrolled away from this page and you get something in an area of the database, you can try to convince me to scroll back to where you tagged it, or you can try to catch up to where I happen to be on the screen, okay? So it's gotta, you know, we gotta see it. I've gotta see it, and I won't see it unless I'm actually uh, paged to it. Okay, no, no goat seat, please. Um, and yeah, that'd be pretty good if you could if you could get that Ida comment in there. Somebody probably somebody somewhere has that. I'm sure. Hey Chris, the we have like five minutes left to demo. Oh. So okay. All right. So here we go. I don't Alt F6 brings it up. Um, I'd been playing around, so it actually cached my server information. Chris with my very secure password. Challenge. Okay. Uh, it. If you're trying to connect and you don't immediately get a login dialog, uh, basically it didn't find the server. Okay. 
Um, so there are probably <laughs> lots of projects in there already. Um, and uh <laughs> wow. I'm going to create a new one whose name is now to be revealed. So um, give me a name. Tell me what you're calling it. What? The demo one is, is the new project. So I'm joined. I'm scrolling away. Hopefully my database will live a while uh, so that Tim and I can um, scroll around. Okay. All right, so I'll throw a comment in here. Where are you at? What's your name? Hand me. Can you get there? Okay, that doesn't count as you getting your name on the screen because I put it there for you. Give the address away, everybody know where I am. There you go. 8049700. Okay, and then the idea is that we try to capture as much state as possible. What's that? And as Tim scrolls in, you see he's already got the comment, and that's that's a simple one. But we can handle a lot of uh, different types of name changes. Okay, so Tim gets the, the, the function name change. Um, we can, you know, go crazy, go nuts with undefines and whatnot. Um, we can reformat. You see Tim is reformatting some operands here. Uh, so it, it picks up. Useful. What's that? That's much more useful. That representation. Yeah, I mean, we can, we, so it captures reformatting changes. Uh, we can get into the structures window. And as I start to create structures, Tim's already got the structure layout over there. And I can come in over here, build structures, and his window follows a change. So it really doesn't matter what part of the database you're working in. Your, your, push, your changes get pushed over. So there's a great billboard for somebody to try to tag um, something on the screen. Um, what other types of changes? Uh, uh, so a really uh, kind of a nice one is that uh, moving away from the sort of hotkey metaphor, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't have that many books for all the eyes out there. Um, <laughs> so we still don't have a winner. Um, IDC and plugins. Okay, when you, when you generate actions in IDA using IDA's scripting language, IDC, or using the, the SDK, those, those things fire event notifications as well. So if one user on a project runs a script that modifies the database, all the actions that that script performed get pushed out to um, uh, everybody else on the project. So you can run a script, run a plugin that, that modifies the database uh, somehow, and uh, those scripts and plugins take effect across um, all the rest of the user. I get a, a bunch of people frantically trying to learn how to change the name of the structure field yeah. in Ida. It's fun. See, we can like chat. Okay. <laughs> so may, maybe only you and I are joined. Oh, what happened over there? What's that? Your comment. Front. I was here. Front row. Well, I see the comment. No. Look, look at what? Yeah, somebody dropped it, but not mine. <laughs> Was it? I don't know. Is that somebody's name? <laughs> Was that? Rot 13 social? Go back to the beginning of what? The database? I should go back where I was before? Maybe I will. Okay, there are bugs, so what? I don't know. Clearly... So structures was actually listed as one of the things that are busted on notifications. It, it, it's actually in your slides. You can scroll back and see that event notifications for structures are kind of broken. Okay, so this is a manifestation of that. <laughs> hey, do you want to show a, a script or a so, somebody's changing plugin names? I mean, you, the, or the, the the structure field names. Okay, they're just choosing not to use like their name. Okay. Uh, what else do you want to show? Scripts. Oh yeah, so scripts. <coughs> so another thing that uh, you can do since you're not doing specific hotkeys, you can get like byte patches or whatever else an IDC script or a plugin could do. So you could actually like, you know, buy an expensive plugin or whatever for one machine 
and then you could use that to drive several IDA instances. Okay, so uh, Tim's going to go to the same address that I'm at, and you'll see I'm going to bring open IDA's uh, scripting dialog box. Okay, go back and uh, grab some IDC script and run the script over uh, the database. You know that Tim knows scripting window over there, two different screens. So I run it. Um, he gets all the transformations, and I can reformat it, make it a string, and we find you know private keys embedded in binaries, and that's kind of cool. That's that's a Ken Shoto binary from last year that some of you may recognize. Um, but again, so scripting actions push, all your actions push. Um, this is by no means, you know, th th this is early beta software. So yeah, there are bugs. Um, we're happy to hear about them. Uh, we will try to respond to them uh, expeditiously. Um, we're happy to hear about uh, potential users, desired uses, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, make myself an open target to try to give the book away. Okay, and see if, are people pushing changes at all? Yeah, you're just getting busted Unicode comments or <laughs> whatever that was. It's just, it's really, it's not showing up? You see mine, but I don't see yours. That's, I have an Atlas filter on it. Yeah. User permissions. <laughs> <laughs> is, is anybody from the audience? What did you? Well, there were those ones that came in, but I don't know who they were. Yeah, I don't. I, on the left. So who was pushing on? I was here front. That's my okay. Left, not the okay. Uh, front row left. G my left. Yeah, that, my that left. works. Okay. Okay. I thought it was the other left. Your left. Yeah, so What's that? Was this guy? Right I don't know. Is he on? Who's on? Uh, you're yeah, on. This guy. Okay. He's, he's he's I think front row left is a winner. Okay. So <laughs> nice job. We're going to wrap up the loose ends on the slides real quick. Oh, yeah. Okay, so again, this just talks about script in, scripts and plugins. Boom, drive it with your scripts or your plugins. Um, so you don't have to share that out. Here's my script, run it on your database. Now they look the same. Okay, pretty easy. Uh, as I mentioned, I like it in a learning environment because you can ask everybody to join in like a, a read only mode. And you can sit there kind of driving their displays to some extent from a, a podium or something like that. Uh, give a demonstration and they can, you know, stay with you. Um, and then here's some uh, things that we're, are, are on the drawing board uh, for future work. We're hoping that the API expands to let us catch some of that pre-change notification. Um, uh, the better permission interface is actually kind of here. Um, we're looking for the project migration, which is actually more or less here. It's just not uh, incorporated yet. Uh, and again, uh, you know, if you're one of the people who studies these types of things, offline change merging and algorithms for doing that. We'll, we'll entertain it, but not sure how we're going to implement it. Um, and I think uh, that's pretty much it. There's our contact information. Again, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, and uh, we're taking questions from now until we're booted. So. Okay. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> it, it's mentioned in the book. Uh, its uses are described in the book, um, but it, you know, like Ida's SDK, it's documented in the source code. The, the usage. The, your question was for usage, right? And the usage is actually uh, documented by any other book uh, that that uses Ida. So this book documents the usage of the plugin very well because you don't have to learn special uh, commands to do anything. As you work on Ida, if you've connected to the server all of your work is going back and forth. Anything that your version of IDA supports uh, publish capabilities for. So that chart uh, that we had earlier. Yeah, it, yeah all open source, all, we're, we're posted all, and again, we're happy to hear of all the potential uses or, and so on. Doc. GPL version two. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Yep. Alice? Oh. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> No. <laughs> Next year. Okay. All right, I think that's it. Enjoy the rest of the con. <laughs> All two minutes. <laughs>